You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Rob Karma, Jim Kassan, Mark Resepsinski, Alan Don and I, Niels Kostov Larsen, where each week we take the polls of the global market through the lens of a rural space investor. Today we're back with part two of our year-end special episode where we all get together for one big conversation and debate. As you know, this podcast series is all about voicing our differences on the one topic that brings us together, namely systematic investing. We're recording on December 6th, and this conversation and what you're hearing right now is the second part of our group conversation. So if you missed part one, make sure you go back and listen to that first. Okay, so last week's conversa- conversation was more focused on key events relating to 2022, um, what stood out and what we learned from it, uh, as well as the differences uh, between explicitly long wall strategies and the long wall nature of trend following, among other things. So today we're going to broaden out the conversation a little bit. Now, the first topic, um, selfishly, is uh, from me. Um, and I wanted to bring up um, diversification um, as a topic. Um, now, this might be a little bit outside your area, Jim, but I actually think uh, it will be interesting to hear your thoughts uh, as as a as a non trend follower, so to speak. Um, so um, so let's see how we we do that. But let me kick off explaining what I was trying to um, to get to. Now, within trend following, we cherish diversification in many different parts of the investment process. And one of them, of course, is the number of markets we trade. And this has often been a question that we've been debated. Uh, And the question is, is more markets really better? Now, I know that Rich, unfortunately, is not here to defend his view, um, but I'll do my best to provide kind of an unbiased context. In simple terms, um, if we trade, for example, 50 markets with a certain level of risk per trade, um, or we could trade 200 markets, Uh, And if we're using the same total risk, we would essentially uh, trade one quarter uh, of the risk uh, per trade in order to get the same uh, total risk. So, so far, I think that's pretty um, uh, uncontroversial. And now, if we trade 200 market as opposed to 50, one of the thoughts I had was, can we or is there a way to be sure that we can find four times as many outliers because... We're obviously only taking a quarter of the risk per trade. Uh, So in order to get to kind of the same uh, opportunity set, uh, so to speak, we should should have more outliers. We should have four times more. Um, Now, that's kind of part one of my question, whether there is any uh, thoughts on that. The other part is this thing about uh, where Rich takes it a little bit further, where he says he prefers to design his trend-following strategy to focus on hunting for outliers, these sort of five percent or so of really big uh, market moves, um, and um, I guess if you do so, uh, you may implicitly leave a lot of profits on the table from the big trends, but not uh, that are good, but not the extreme outlier trends. I think that's also a fair uh, expectation. Um, and, and, and again, I'm interested in your view on this as well, uh, Jim, but I was trying to think of a volatility analogy, uh, and obviously probably not come up with a very good example, but I wonder if it's like buying a put or call option far out of the money. So sure, you're going to make a lot of money if you're right and you get this massive outlier move, but you're also going to see a lot of those trades turn out worthless if the move just isn't big enough. I don't know whether that's a good, um, uh, analogy or not. So long-winded question, um, you know, what's your view about kind of these extreme outliers with payouts compared to trying to capture maybe a bigger part of the distribution, um, but where the uh, where you may also get a smaller payout on the extreme outliers um, because you may do other things to uh, in, in order to catch the, the you know, a broader set of, of trades. So I'm going to start off with you, Rob, if you don't mind, because obviously you're in the system design kind of um, realm. Um, yeah. But what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I think I can address the first question quite easily. Um, and actually, relate the, 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 the options example is an excellent one. 
um, because the key thing about buying out, out of the money options is that there's a huge um, difference um, in magnitude between the premium you're paying out and the potential return you could get, right? It's a highly positive skewed distribution. Um, and that means that that even if you have to buy loads and loads of these things, you're shelling out loads and loads of premium, sure, um, but you're still going to get those big outliers arriving in your in your portfolio and, you, you know, um, the upside is, isn't really going to be harmed by the fact that you're having to buy more of these things um, because, the, you know, there's this huge difference between the magnitude of the potential return and the premium you're paying out. Now, in the sort of trend space, um, because we can kind of do this mapping of, of between a trend and a, a long volatility strategy, um, they're sort of the same thing, right? We, always, we say this quite a lot, that their payoff structure looks very similar and their return profiles are very similar as well in the sense that they'll often bleed money for long periods of time, which is like you're out of the money options not paying off. Um, and um, you know, every now and then you get a big spike and you get your outliers, and that's great. Um, now, the there is something you can do with your trend strategy, which is something I do, to make it even more like the option strategy, and that's to have a variable forecast. Um, or to think of it in simple terms, it'd be something where as a trend strengthens, you build your position, you make position bigger. Uh, and if you do that, that means that the the difference in in magnitude between a, a market where there's not not really very much has happened, so it's just facilitating long short, long short. You have a very small position each time. You're gradually bleeding away money, sure, but it's not really hurting your overall portfolio. And then all of a sudden, it goes completely stratospheric. And as it's you know going hyperbolic and stratospheric. Um, you know, and reaching for the moon or whatever, you're you're building a position more and more and more, and that means the potential returns increasing and increasing. Um, and and on that one one, you know, on that very small number of markets, you'll end up with these huge returns compared to small losses and everything else, effectively. Um, so that's one way to make your trend following strategy a bit like holding a portfolio of out of the money, you know, straddles or whatever. Um, so so I think. Um, personally, I think that the value of extra diversification is worth it. You know, because there's, if if all of these things had a straightforward linear payoff, then obviously mathematically, Niels, you'd be right. You know, buying four times as many markets means yes, you've got four times as many chances as as buying the winning lottery tickets, if you like. Um, but the potential return is going to be divided by four because you you know because the risk on each is a quarter. Um, so so net net, you don't really gain anything. Um, but, it, but in practice, it's not like that because of this massive difference between the, the effectively what's a bit like an option premium, what's a bit like a, you know, a, an option payoff. Uh, and as someone who hasn't traded options for 20 years, I'm very much aware that I'm not an expert in the field. And I look forward to hearing from our in-house options expert on, on what he thinks of my terrible analogy. Exactly. Jim, what are your thoughts? No, I mean, I think I think you got it right. Look, I, I think... The first part of this conversation, you let off let off with uh, the rise of carry. I think that's such an appropriate way to lead off the whole conversation, right? We've been in this environment um, for some time now, which has been um, more certain outcomes, more leverage, more momentum, um, you know, uh, and yet more short term tail, more more extreme short term tail, right? Um, and that's that speaks to that skewness and that that change in the distribution. Um, and in those environments, uh, you know, probably good to be concentrated, right? Um, less diverse outcomes, right? More kind of the Fed controlling a very controlled system in a certain way, right? But within that, having, you know, big blowups and then kind of continuation of, of, uh, of, of a more kind of severe certain outcome. Uh, if the Fed loses control, if the if rates go higher, if there's less leverage, if it's a more two-sided market, right? That's a different distribution as we kind of talked about last, last episode. And in those environments, uh, there's more uncertainty and there's more two-sided outcomes. And you probably want to be playing 200 uh, names. You probably want to be out there uh, in different places in the market with more uh, opportunities on top of that. Uh, as I mentioned, less liquidity means higher risk premium, more opportunity in different places, more uh, fluidity. So that also increases the opportunity in different places. It, it's a more complex market uh, in that world and a more open for opportunity. And there you want to really diversify. So I would argue it depends. It depends on the environment. But I do think we're going to get into an environment where you'll probably be what better served by being uh, kind of exposing yourself to a broader diversification of, of opportunities. And, and I think particularly here on this turn, this regime shift, 
I think the opportunities are probably wider and more varied, uh, you know, and, and there's more just um, fishing in, in the, the little pond that we're, we're fishing in um, as well, which opens the opportunity for more, um, you know, putting more lines out there. Sure, sure. Mark, Alan, any of you want to sort of uh, dive in on this or? Well, as I thought more and more about this whole outlier problem, I, I actually th think of it in, in two parts. One is, is that outliers are time specific. So in some sense is that I could have outliers over a two week period. I could also have outliers over the, uh, over a year period. And there, there's a fundamental difference between the two and how you capture a outlier over a two week period is different than the way you capture it, an outlier for a year. So oftentimes when the conversation about outliers is, is had, we say like, well, look at this market has moved up by 150%. So, so like, well, that, that could be a, a large number. Okay. But you have to look at it in the context over the time frame it did it. This is that sometimes if a market moves by 10% over two weeks, that's a bigger, that could be a bigger outlier. And so, so sometimes uh, if you're capturing for a long-term outliers or the, the large dispersion, you're going to have to use one type of model, a long-term trend model. If you're looking for outliers over a short horizon, then you're going to have to have a different model. So, and the second part is always, uh, it's not so much the size of the outlier as how much of it you actually capture. Because I don't know how many times I've gone to clients and they say like, oh, they look at a chart and they'll say, look, there was a large move. You should, you know, any idiot should have made money. <laughs> and, and I'm the idiot who did not make money over that period because maybe I was using a faster model. And so I could have been in and out of a position a number of times. So, 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 so it's, one, you need to have out, uh, outliers or you need to have big moves. But the question is, do you actually capture it? And so if you give back half the uh, half the move, I don't know, is that something to be proud of? If I only cap, if there's a 100% move or over a, of a given market over a period of time and I only capture, let's say, less than 50% of that, is that something to be proud of? So, so I think that you always have to put this outlier view in context. And by definition, the more markets you trade, at some point you're going to, to dissipate the value of any one of those outliers that you might capture. Alan, um, I don't know what your allocator eyes uh, uh, have seen over the years. I've always been reasonably vocal about saying that I see no evidence when I look at track records from various managers, those who trade hundreds of markets and those who trade kind of the classic 50 or 60 markets. I don't see any evidence that 200 markets are better than uh, 50, 60 markets. Yeah, I think... Of course, I'm not an I mean, allocator I think, I think, like you. I think, so. you know... From first principles, you would say more markets is more diversification, more opportunities. You would say should be better. You know, the idea of, of trend following is it's a small edge in any individual market, but a big part of the benefit comes from applying it to many markets. I mean, obviously, you get diminishing returns over time um, or as you add more markets. Um, I think... Um, you know, you, obviously there's costs, there's liquidity as you move into the kind of the alternative markets that you have to be cognizant of. And then you've got, well, the question is how much do you lever up for, for, for having those markets and have you got correlation risk? Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think I haven't looked at it to say, uh, you know, that the, the more diversified managers have done better. Um, I think I think it's interesting, you know, if you think about it, there's nearly three philosophies. At the other extreme, you've got maybe trend replication trading only 10 markets you have a lot of the traditional ctas maybe trading kind of 50 to 80 markets and then you have a few managers trading 200 300 i think even more maybe 400 markets so different philosophies on this i think maybe one thing to think and think about is the kind of the trend replication philosophy is about capturing big macro shifts saying you know if there's big changes in bonds and equities in the major markets it'll capture it Whereas if you're trading three, four hundred markets, you're, you're you're capturing much more idiosyncratic moves in individual markets. So the nature of the return profile may be more driven by, you know, 
what's going on in individual markets and energy and commodities for those versus uh, you know the smaller number of markets it's going to be more influenced by by, by, by macro risk so I, I I don't know if I couldn't say one is better um in theory more I would have said is better but uh, if there's diminishing returns um, to, to more markets I think the second thing I would just say is this whole discussion around outliers and it's uh, you know it's obviously something rich talks about jerry uh, parker a bit it's almost like a different philosophy that there's two different philosophies one is a, a belief in trends and serial correlation and and running trend following strategies on that basis and then a second one is that you get these periodic moves in markets every once in a while you get these big outlier trades and you're constructing a system to capture that and that the latter s- seems more like a kind of a tail risk kind of up long vol type strategy as as rob's talking about um so i think it's interesting that the people end up running trend following maybe from different philosophies ultimately similarly positioned but 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 kind of driven by different beliefs one an academic kind of there is serial uh, correlation evident in markets so let's construct trend following for that basis and the other one being you know, periodically you get these blow ups in markets, outlier moves. So let's construct uh, systems to capture those. So that, that that that's the kind of the interesting aspect from from my perspective. Sure, sure. And all I just wanted to add to my uh, observation about not seeing any evidence of one being uh, better than the other. What I will say, um, and I've mentioned that before, and that is, I do see them being different. Meaning that clearly some of these uh, funds during three, four hundred markets will have performance um at different times uh compared to others that that is of course clear so neil i guess the one more on this issue is this is that there's a difference between how many you trade versus how many you search on and and so so in some senses is that uh i think everyone would sort of say like you would like to search as great a number of markets you can but you want to trade uh trade less. So you search more, trade less. And and ultimately, when you look at all of the uh, risk premium analysis on uh, cross-sectionally, this is what they do. So if let's say I'm looking at uh, value trades. So what, someone said, I don't trade value on everything. What I do is if I look at the Russell you know, 2000, what I'll do is I'll rank order all of the stocks and, uh, based on some value criteria. And I'm going to go along the, uh, you know, the ones that are sort of the best value and short the ones that are least value. So in some sense, I search more, but trade less. So I conditional on a sort of phenomena. And so, uh, so in some sense, what you have to sort of say is that if you're looking for outliers, you may not always want to trade everything, but you want to search for everything. And, and there's a distinction between, uh, between those two activities. All right, moving on to our topic from Dublin. Um, and um, feel free, Alan, to expand on this. Um, but of course, one of the biggest changes we've seen in the last year that I do think has an effect on probably most markets is the fact that we've had this massive change in interest rate levels from pretty much zero. Now we're at three to five percent, depending on which country you're looking at. Um, you know, how does that change strategies like volatility and, and and trend following? That's kind of how I assessed your question, Alan. Do you want to add something before we 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 go around? Um, no, I mean, I think it's a big jump in the in the rate environment. Uh, you know. From zero to five percent, so that you you will get um, kind of a reassessment of asset allocation. So um, yeah, I, I I guess you know one of the things that that that, that I would say is that in in the low rate environment, maybe going back uh, 12, 18 months, if you were making the case for managed futures strategies, you know the the low returns in traditional assets was a key part of it. Now we're into a, a higher rate environment. Um, so to what extent does does that kind of change? Um, change the, the you know the the case from an asset allocation perspective sure um rob any thoughts on that i mean something we've already touched on is that actually when interest rates go up your returns from having money in a cta also increase because you know one of the great things about about um futures trading unless your leverage is excessively high is that you'll mostly have a bunch of money sitting around doing pretty much nothing um, so you you'd actually now be getting a you know a, a few percent in in annual interest on that which you wouldn't have got you know a year ago so that you know that actually feeds directly into your expected returns on that side as well um I, I'll be honest i I'm a bit of a skeptic of 
you know, coming up with numbers and saying, oh, yes, over the next 10 years, stocks will return 7%, bonds will return 3%, CTAs will return 8%, and therefore this is the optimal asset allocation. I, I find that a little bit, um, you know, very hard to do, frankly. And, and within my own personal portfolio, I pretty much just keep keep the numbers fixed, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I, I mean... It's you. You could argue that that there should be perhaps more of a tilt towards bonds because yields are higher. Potentially a tilt towards equities because you know valuation ratios have been uh, uh, looking nicer than they were. I mean, they they got pretty crazy, particularly in the US. Things like you know the Shiller PE were just like really massively high. Um, but but it's it's not stuff that's going to move the needle very much. I mean, we're we're talking about reallocations of perhaps. Five percent, ten percent, and the absolute maximum. So, um, you know, um, I, I'd almost question whether it's worth doing that stuff, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, skeptics sitting here and frankly not bothering to do anything with his allocation. <laughs> uh, Jim, um, from a vol point of view, a, a change in, in in interest rates like this. Yeah. Um, we've done a, a recent study. You and I briefly talked about it on another pod recently. Um, but I think this is an interesting place to dive in on it. You know, basically looking during inflationary, kind of secularly inflationary regimes, how do different asset classes perform? And that's not just how does, do they go up, do they go down? What does that shape of the distribution look like? And I think what's the personality of these different asset classes? So again, when I talk about vol, most people think vol is an asset class. For me, vol is not an asset class. It is the distri underlying distribution of every asset class, right? So, you know, if we talk, speak to kind of those distributions and how are they different in inflationary regimes? Again, that's my opinion based on some of our macro work um, that, that we're likely to see here for the next five, 10 years. Um, how do different things perform and how's that different in the last 40? And, and what we kind of learned, and you know, I'll kind of break this into kind of two pieces to start is, is you know, what is the short-term volatility of each asset class, right? And then what is the, the kind of the longer-term trend and the longer-term ball, right? Um, I'll break this into five asset classes, uh, equities, bonds, uh, FX, uh, commodities uh, like, like oil, and we'll use oil as a proxy, and then uh, gold, Right. If we look at those five asset classes, and I'll try and be quick about this, uh, what we find is that risk premia go up because there's less liquidity and short term volatility goes up for equities, for gold, for treasuries, for FX. Um, and ironically, the one that it doesn't go up for is oil and commodities, which is kind of counterintuitive. And, and we'll kind of talk about that. But then directional, uh, what we see is in nominal ways, equities actually flatline in nominal terms, right? Because of these first and second order effects, which we kind of reference. Oil, kind of, uh, when I say FX, I'm going to talk, talk about the dollar. The dollar, uh, you know, we had dollar strength. We get oil, oil uh, secular strength, longer term strength, uh, treasury decline, as we would expect, and then gold strength, right? So most hard assets are getting, uh, and I include dollars in that, even though they're not a hard asset, a, you know, uh, have a, uh, a positive right trend, Right. As you would expect, um, uh, you know, treasuries, uh, you know, being the opposite of yields have a, a negative trend and equities, ironically, don't have that. They go as a risk asset more more sideways. So what does that mean and what's been priced in? Um, one, we've seen uh, an increase in vol and treasuries and FX and uh, commodities and equities not so much in, in gold, which I think is interesting. So when I kind of look through this, we've seen kind of an efficient response by in FX. We've seen a relatively efficient move in treasuries, right? Uh, in terms of the vol markets and the, the expectations of those markets, um, those, those areas are less interesting now for me. Again, we were very uh, actively saying people should get into what, what is cheap FX vol and cheap treasury vol a year and a half, two years ago, but those markets have adapted. Um, gold uh, has been kind of a counterintuitive move and gold, the gold vol hasn't gone. I think that's a very interesting place to actually now step in, both in terms of more positive trend, uh, you know, uh, as well as uh, in terms of buying vol. So long dated calls look very, very cheap in gold, which I think is an interesting kind of uh, thing. Now, on the other end of that, oil, oil vol has gone up, right? Commodity vol has gone up. And uh, historically, during these periods, and, and I'm going to dive into this topic a little bit more, you actually see vol compression in these periods. Again, I know that's counterintuitive, knowing that we had the OPEC crisis, and et cetera. Uh, Longer-term vol 
uh, gets compressed uh, in an even medium term ball. Why? Because much like the Fed kind of controlled the FX and treasury markets for 20, 30 years, right? Because you have this 10,000 pound gorilla, you know, uh, you know, the big bully in the room controlling those markets and controlling ultimately the vol in those markets and creating a certain kind of trend. Now you have kind of OPEC and uh, oil producers who are uh, in a time of resource scarcity, probably during an inflationary period, right? Much more in control than maybe they were uh, during other non-inflationary periods. And this can drive a put underneath the market, right? Um, for, for commodities like oil and, and that put, much like the Fed put, right, can compress volatility in that space. Um, that's counterintuitive, but in a period of inflation, we get resource scarcity, hard assets, and the holders of those hard assets have more power, uh, have more centralized power, and have the ability uh, historically to control the downside uh, in those in, in those assets. And that, that reduction of uh, making it from a two-sided market into a one-sided market, much like uh, these other asset classes when the Fed was in control, right, um, now uh, provides a put to that market historically. And we've seen some of these effects already coming into the market, right? The, uh, not just OPEC, but with the, you know, the SPR draining, now there's a $72, uh, $70 put, uh, uh, you know, where they're refilling the SPR. OPEC plus has come in and, and, and defined that they're going to defer, defend certain levels uh, because they can, because they can, and, and that, and they have more power in this type of market that should compress commodity vol, not just in the short term, but over longer time frames, frames, and it should create a very secular move in oil over the long term higher as well. It creates almost like an equity type uh, distribution to commodities uh, in this environment, whereas we've had that for equities for some time. Now, ironically, now, so that, that would be a, a sale of all there, right? Uh, whereas I'm saying buy, you want to buy commodity uh, so gold vol, you want to really sell commodity vol. I think that's like one area where it's been really overdone if you look at a kind of a secular time frame. And then lastly, in an inflationary period, equities, uh, you know, as I kind of referenced uh, on the last episode, uh, you know, there's an argument to because you have a much more two sided market, right? Even though short term vol will be higher and you'll have a higher risk premium. Uh, that longer term ball mean reversion and, and uh, you know, longer term balls are, are largely a sale during inflationary periods on what is it otherwise a nominal asset with those first order effects that a lot of those gold and oil and whatever benefit from. But the second order effects, which is the reduction in, in demand, the, the, the reverse Tina effect, all these other things that take money away from risk assets and deleverage the system that really pull demand away. So much more two-sided market, much more mean reverting market with vol compression um, is much more likely there. So that's kind of what we see out of the distributions. So, you know, we could spend a whole hour going through all of these and, and, and get into more detail and maybe we'll do that on another pod. But, but it, um, you know, there's some places that have completely reacted, uh, overreacted. There's some places that seem normal, but there are real opportunities on a, on a macro scale and the market's still really adjusting to what I believe is a regime shift. Sure. And, and and Mark, from your point of view, this massive change in interest rates, um, what what effects do you think it, it may or may not have? Well, of course, it's going to have a, have an impact. But let's talk about how that impact actually translates to trend models and pricing in general. So when you have an increase in interest rates, okay, what you usually find is that there's an increase in interest rate volatility. So so that the uh, level of rates tells us something about you know rate volatility with and so what you find out is is that with that level of rates goes up and if volatility was still low people could adjust but let's go back to first principles so when you price any asset what you do is you discount cash flows and if the discount rate becomes more volatile then prices become more volatile. And so there's going to be more dispersion in, in re return. It's sort of interesting is that like even let you look at the last couple of days is, is that instead of people focusing on the impact on the uh, numerator on earnings, everyone talks about what's the terminal rate that the Fed is going to do. So it's what's the volatility and the discount rate that's going to be driving you know, performance in equity markets and bond markets. Second of all, is that when you find out is, is, is that as rates get higher, now you're going to get more dispersion in expectations, which opens up a whole new set of trading. So before when we had r rates very low and we had strong forward guidance, you know, this are basically trading on, you know, back end euro dollars or short term interest rates that 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 
that business was dead, you know, so, so, but now all of a sudden with rates higher, now people sort of say, well, what's the probability of rates going to be above 5% versus below 5% after March? It opens up a whole new set of trading that we didn't see before. So one higher rates, uh, uh, rates affects discount rates, which then translates to an impact on all asset classes. And two, higher rates leads to a dispersion in expectations. We now can have more trading because people have difference of opinion on what the level of rates should be going forward. And so, so that's the real impact of what's going to happen. So when you talk about a secular change, this is that, you know, you look at the post great financial crisis, which we often talk about as the lost decade for trend following. It's because, you know, if rates are, uh, are flat, there's no change in the discount rate for a lot of asset classes, yeah, you're not going to get the same kind of dispersion. Now, all of a sudden, this is, is that we've got rates going up and we go back to the first principles of discounting. All of a sudden, now we're going to get more dispersion in, uh, in you know, uh, pricing, which can now lead to greater opportunities. So that's what's really you know, going on, I think. Sure. Fair point. Fair point. All right. Let's move on to a topic that came from Rob. Um, again, one of those that only had like two words in it. Um, so you might want to have to set your uh, your the context a little bit here, Rob. Um, and um, and it, it, the words you gave me was uh, AI and trading. So artificial intelligence and trading. So um, so uh, enlighten us. Where are we going with this, Rob? Yeah. So AI is another thing that I'm a well known skeptic of. Um, at least in relation to the financial markets. Um, I guess I have this view that as most people are terrible traders, there's no reason why a computer trained to behave like a human should be a great trader, right? Um, but, but in the last, literally the last week, there's been a real game changer in AI. There's been a release of this this thing called GPT-3, which is a, um, a new advanced kind of natural language model. And um, if, you, if you go on Twitter, it's full of people um, posting conversations they've had with it. And it is quite extraordinary, the stuff that this thing can do. So um, it was a random example. If you say to it something like, you know, summarize for me this Shakespeare play, but using the voice of Groucho Marx, it'll, it'll, it'll do that. I mean, it's, it's quite, it's quite, you know, it's quite incredible, really. Um, and people have also said that it can do stuff like, for example, replace Google search and write code for you. Um, um, but the mass, there's a couple of massive caveats around that. One is that um, the training set for this data only goes up to 2021. So don't try asking it anything recent. It just won't know about it. Uh, and the other thing is it just generally does get stuff wrong. Um, it, it's kind of sp spookily right, but then it will make a mistake. You'll get something wrong and you... and, and um, you know, which is fine if you're just playing with it. But if you generally think it's going to replace Google search, then that's potentially dangerous. Uh, and the same goes when it's writing code as well, actually. It often produces perfectly good code. Um, but but then the code will have an error in it or, you know, a mistake or won't compile. And it's it, because at the end of the day, all this thing is doing is effectively saying, well, given this string of characters, what string of characters should come next, given the training set, which is effectively the whole internet. So it's it's not really thinking in any, any key way. Anyway, having said all that, um, I do wonder whether there's going to be a, 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 a new rise in people saying that that you know there's going to be a, all of these brilliant AI techniques are going to revolutionise um, the, the you know the development of, of systematic trading models, um, and this is a this is a kind of hype that's been an awfully long time coming because um, I still don't see any evidence of this. But uh, as always, I remain open-minded, and I'd be curious to to know whether. Uh, the other the other guys on the panel have a, a similar kind of grumpy old man opinion to me, or they're like, actually, you know what? The the pace of change on this thing is so incredible; it's not unrealistic to think in a couple of years' time we'll be at the point where we can literally say, right, model here's data, go away, make a cup of coffee, come back, completely brilliant trading model, not not overfitted, ready to go. Um, I, I you know I'm very skeptical we'll get there in my lifetime even, but you know, what do you guys think? Well, I mean, it sounds a little bit like all the promises uh, that were made about self-driving cars. Um, and uh, so, um, but I, just to be clear here, Rob, it's not Elon Musk or, or anyone or who's behind this new uh, Um I think he may actually call be it. one of the co-investors. Ah. So, oh, yeah. Okay. But, but, I um, think that's an important message to, uh, yeah. or a piece of information yeah. to know. Because I should say, uh, Jim, I'm up front, I'm pretty skeptical about everything that Elon Musk has ever been involved with as well. So there may be a theme here, but... Uh, 
<laughs> on this occasion, my skepticism is not purely Musk based. I have other reasons to be skeptical. Okay, fair enough. Jim, skeptic, not skeptic? Um, Look, I think uh, given enough time, I think we, uh, you know, evolution is is a powerful force and uh, it's exponential. And we are, you know, uh, we are heading towards a, a period where I think we, you know, our, our brain and the way it processes is, in my opinion, uh, we, there's a lot of things we don't know, right? A, a, a very sophisticated computer. Right. And so, you know, can we create something that ultimately uh, is an improved version of that computer? Yes, in my opinion. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have biases and things that have been uh, ingrained over long evolutionary periods that probably aren't suited for the current system. Right. And that's well documented by all these biases that we all know about. So if we can uh, take those biases out and have a more uh, kind of open way to model, a more open uh, system to model things. Uh, yes. Now we are still so early on that in that process and that doesn't happen over uh, weeks, months, years, even it, it happens over uh, decades and centuries. Um, and, uh, but it's accelerating. And so my view is, yeah, I think AI um, will, uh, you know, you can have smarter people, you can have better computers, you can have better systems. And I think, uh, you know, my view would be that uh, over longer time frames that these things are, uh, are, are net positive, and I think uh, that's probably well well proven uh, in in data. Uh, you know, there's a there's a reason certain players in the market have been able to get certain returns over certain periods of time uh, from a quantitative approach. So, um, but uh, but that's my opinion. And, and again, uh, people have different. These are big big questions, right? These are these are, nobody's got the market cornered on these, uh, and and it definitely is a place where opinion matters. Mark, you write a, write a blog post every day. I'm sure AI has been part of your um, many hundreds of uh, of posts. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, we'll sort of say the idea of AI has been oversold. The impact of data science and machine learning has probably been undersold. And what I mean by that is, is, is that, uh, you know, I, I sort of came of age in more of the early 80s, you know, graduate programs. So, so we always thought in terms of econometrics. So there was no data science that we, we often thought about. And when you look at, think about the advancements of supervised, unsupervised learning, different techniques to try to be able to extract information from data, this has been a huge boom for trading, for strategies, and for just insights about data. And that has had a really large impact on trading and on how people view opportunities, whether that can be converted, converted into an artificial intelligence that will be able to be a perpetual money machine is a completely different uh, question. So let's go back to your uh, self-driving car story. Uh, this is it like, uh, I sort of believe that we'll, we probably will have self-driving cars, but I probably, if I got into a self-driving taxi, I'd still probably want to have someone in, in behind a steering wheel to watch. And so that occasionally, if it looks like we're headed for a brick wall, it might actually hit the brake and override the system. So, so we're not going to eliminate people. And what you find out also when you talk about artificial intelligence is, is that your model or the artificial intelligence you build is a function of the builder. Who is the builder makes a tremendous number of choices on what he plans to add, what he doesn't add, what emphasis he places. So anyone who thinks that you could just build a model with uh, AI technology and sort of say that and you're going to get you know, a great solution is mistaken. It takes a lot of work and effort to understand how you build a model, what assumptions you make, and what outputs you're actually going to get. So, so it's a work in progress. Absolutely. Any wise words from Dublin, Alan, on AI? Or Nothing much to add. I mean, I agree with, of it? you know, what, what Marcus said in particular, you know, it just strikes me, we had a lot of, um, in the CTA space, a lot of machine learning uh, systems, programs really being heavily marketed, you know, around a time when more traditional taxi techniques weren't working back in, you know, 2018, 2019. Um, 
hasn't, you know, you don't hear as much about it of late, but certainly managers, I know of individual managers who have incorporated uh, machine learning techniques into their systems um, evidently successfully. So, yeah, a huge advantage, advantages, um, advances in, in computing power. And you can see the potential, so can't say no, but... Um, um, it does seem to be a, a cyclical thing that it, it it comes on the radar, um, you know, wh- 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 every so often. So I've an open mind, but but nothing to add uh, to what the guys have said. Yeah, no, I I think I would agree with that. I do remember very early on in one of the first maybe first hundred episodes that I recorded, I did record an episode with someone who truly believed that they had found the holy grail with machine learning and AI and had you know, gotten the best professor to to build this. And it all looked fantastic. But within a year of our recording, uh, it had blown up. Uh, so, uh, well, it, now, Neil, this is that one thing you should always talk about is, is that, that how the evolution of strategies is driven by two factors, the cost of transacting and the cost of computing power. This is that so so when you go back into the you know early eighties, you'd sort of say, why were a lot of people long-term trend followers? The reason why they were long-term trend followers was not because it may have been the holy grail solution. It was because the cost of trading was really expensive. If you actually realized is that you got cheap rates if you did eighty dollars a round turn, which is just you know crazy. So no one was gonna run a fast system at eighty dollars a round turn. The second is, is is that you know if you you know like you know if you look at some of the old boxes of computers, this is that you sort of say like you couldn't test a lot of strategies for a simple reason you didn't have the computing power to do it. So so the uh, evolution of trading strategies is is uh, occurs because the cost structure of the businesses has changed, and that's what's really driving a lot of innovation in strategy development. All right, um, we've got a couple of topics left for this um, year-end uh, group conversation. Um, I'm going to go with Mark's one, and then I'm going to round off with a, a final one. Um, but Mark, you brought up uh, the topic of liquidity. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, we already mentioned in our conversation uh, the LME, and I read this week uh, that they had come out saying that their intervention apparently in the nickel market was necessary to avoid a $20 billion margin call that would have sent the market into a death spiral and threatened the exchange's own survival. That's what they said about that. Um, I know that obviously that, you know, the whole uh, nickel market uh, had massive effects with uh, trades being canceled, the market being closed for a few days. Um, Jim and I has also have also talked about uh, you know liquidity changing in in the options markets recently. Um, so, um, but I'm going to start with um, maybe Mark. Do you want to say anything uh, on the topic briefly before we hear what the other guys have to say about liquidity? Well, we've had this underlying view by the Fed that said is that we're going to raise rates until something breaks. <laughs> so, so, so what is the most likely to break in 2023? And my view is liquidity and liquidity sort of scares issues, scare the heck out of me, because when you think about it is, is, is that trend followers are liquidity takers. Generally, they're not liquidity providers. So my lifeblood of being a trend follower is, is that there has to be somebody to take the other side of the trade. And my ability to be able to take out profits or extract money is based on liquidity. There's no liquidity or liquidity changes. This is that uh, it's the death knell, not only for trend following, but for a lot of other strategies. This is that we'll probably sort of say that more so than leverage, because you say like, hey, we can get changes in leverage and we'll adapt to it. This is that a fundamental decline in liquidity will be a death knell to many hedge funds, to many strategies, and is probably the something that will break in 2023 that will uh, will have you know major impact. And the one example at the extreme on liquidity was is that when they said uh, the Blackstone Real Estate Fund, where they put up you know sort of, sort of basically they limit the liquidity of how much can they actually leave the fund. So we have a tremendous number of ETFs that have. Uh, that is giving liquidity to investors for illiquid assets. 
and that's going to come back to haunt a lot of people. So, so this issue of liquidity is is a is a something that is pervasive across all markets, and it is fundamental to what, what's going to happen in the next year. Yeah, Alan, I'm going to allow, allow you to uh, jump in uh, early on this one, uh, so you don't have to just say I agree with everything that's been said. <laughs> um, now I better have something to say on liquidity. Um, <laughs> no, you don't have to. It's completely I, I, to I think you. two things. What, what, you've got liquidity, which is obviously an issue that's always a concern in markets, and um, you know, is it more of a concern now? You know, I, I think certainly in the treasury market there is a concern. We, we, you know, we had the issues in March 2020 when basically the Fed had to intervene because you had massive basis trades from hedge funds. So we, we, we did see an incident there where, you know, there was um, an issue, a potential issue. It got, you know, all of these things off, off, seemed to get resolved until the next crisis. But 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 it, it, did, it did highlight a potential crack in the system. And, you know, that reflected as, as well various kind of, you know, maybe changes in the market um, microstructure over the years, you know, uh, Dodd-Frank, you know, less prop desk trading in investment banks, so banks don't hold inventory of assets and all of this stuff, and then more um, high-frequency traders and that uh, these, you know, high-frequency fre- market makers tend to disappear as, as volatility picks up and, and then spreads widen out. So, and, 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 you know, we saw that this kind of market action maybe a little bit in Sterling recently, you, you know, when I had a sell off, uh, you know, had a big dive down on, on a Sunday night. So we do see these periodic um, liquidity issues so, you know, as as Mark said, f- trend followers are price takers. So, it could be an issue in 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 an individual market. Obviously, you know, we don't know uh, it, all of these things. You know, the, tre- the the Treasury have been in- investigating, looking at the the uh, Treasury market. You know, serving banks, asking what what they should be doing, etc. So, um, I. I it's it's hard to know. It it, it is it, it is a, a you know a, a tail risk out there. Um, you could get caught w- w- on the on the wrong side of that. I think the second thing in this broad category, I'm not sure if you call it liquidity, but I think it's linked in is, you know, the shadow shadow banking system and and everything that goes with that. And are there risks out there? You know, as I said before, you had this kind of issue in March 2020 with hedge funds doing a lot of these basis trades and you've got a lot of exposure now out in the shadow uh, banking system and the bis had their report out yesterday and there was a headline i haven't read it yet but a headline about you know the the non-bank system having 60 trillion in in fx swaps kind of unaccounted for or i'm not sure exactly what it was but you know, so so there is this growth in the in the in the shadow banking system, which is you know hedge funds, pension funds, um, um, you know, or anybody who's not kind of a, 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 who's taken big 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 trades in and risk in markets and uh, not a not a kind of regulated credit institution. But there is there there remains the question that 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 are banks levered into these um, shadow banks as well in some shape or form. So I think that's the you know the area where nobody really knows how that plays out. You know, and it could could there be a, a problem there? And then you know, are are banks going to be exposed by their by their prime brokerage uh, divisions, etc.? So yeah, I think it is a, a black swan. It is something that if you were writing a, a list of risks in in markets at the moment, um, a blow up in the in the shadow banking system would be one, and that having a, a, a an impact on, on on liquidity in some market at, at some point in time, it certainly is a risk. Yeah, yeah. I know Jim is itching to say something, but before he does, Rob, um, liquidity. Any any thoughts uh, on? Yeah, on this I mean, topic? but bond, bonds, government bonds are interesting because um, you know. So if you read the excellent newsletter that Matt Levon. Bloombo puts out every day. Um, you know, you have this for a while it's recurring kind of headline. Everyone is worried about bond market liquidity, and there are a number of reasons for that. So one was, as as Alan says, regulation making it harder for for banks to warehouse this stuff on their balance sheets, which is obviously as a market maker makes life difficult. Um, and um, but another another reason for it was the fact that there were just fewer bonds out there because of QE. The kind of free float, if you like, of the government bond market was relatively small. There weren't many bonds to trade. Um, so I think, and that is one thing that is reversing now, right? We know as as as, as the the balance sheets of the central banks get reduced, and there are going to be, I think, there are going to be more bonds out there. Uh, and certainly in in the UK, you know, we're we're running a kind of reasonably expansionary fiscal policy, 
um, which means there'll be more bonds issued. So um, I, th- I think bond market liquidity at least will probably be be okay. Um, and um, you know, as, as, a, as a futures trader, um, I, I kind of take liquidity as an input into my system rather than worrying about you know worrying about it too much. So I just say, well, I'm, if the market's not liquid enough, I'm going to I'm not going to trade it anymore. So um, you know, and, um, that, that's my kind of pragmatic approach to dealing with changes in liquidity. Um, but yeah, specifically in bonds, I think things may actually improve in the near future rather than get worse. Yeah, interesting. All right, Jim, you've been waiting patiently to uh, weigh in on this. Uh, I do want to encourage you uh, to um, do it relatively uh, short because we have one big topic left, um, but uh, I know it's a big thing for you. Yeah, liquidity is, uh, you know, one side of, uh, you know, it's two sides of the coin, same coin with volatility, right? Uh, liquidity drives risk premia. It drives uh, the shape of the distribution, as as we we're talking about prior. Um, we talked about this briefly, and I'll try and be quick with this, but the S&P 500 particularly is a major source of liquidity and hedging. Um, the amount of hedging in that space has helped compress uh, vol and uh, has been the source of liquidity. We've had all kinds of uh, volatility increasing around the center of which is equity, domestic U.S. equity vol. And that vol has been the kind of that, that Dutch boy with his you know, thumb in the dike, kind of holding back the the water, uh, you know, on the other side. Um, you know that that hedging. So we had a, a market that was essentially seven, a hundred percent equity exposure with a think of it as a thirty delta put in the market. So seventy, you know, percent beta, a point seven beta to the market broadly structure. We're still there at point seven beta, but instead of a hundred percent equity exposure and a thirty delta put, we broadly have. 70% equity exposure, no put. And that's the same beta. So to a lot of people out there that are just looking directionally, they think, well, this market is uh, you know about the same level as it was. And the reality is there's just a much fatter tail. People are not as hedged for a downside move when it, if and when it comes. This is that sec- cyclical effect that we see people crowding into vol, crowding out of vol, right? That we're in the zeroth percentile because of all the liquidation of all because it hasn't been performing and people are probably not hedged in the domestic equity space. That is a transition from a, a room full of pillows, right? Where something happens, you get knocked over, you're okay, to a, to a room full of kind of an inch of gasoline, right? To, uh, that doesn't mean something's going to happen, but the distribution has changed and the fat, you know, in the short term, if there is a fat tail developing because there's just less liquidity, that liquidity, what I reference is not just broad liquidity, it's liquidity on the tail. And that's where the tail, that's where the liquidity matters most. Um, that's where the most leverage is in the system. That's where things get ugly. That's where everybody tries to get out at the same time. And that's where the liquidity is the poorest. And we've had good liquidity on the tail uh, this year. Uh, I, we see that structurally diminishing. And that is, the again, the Dutch boy with his thumb in the dike. He's tired. He wants to go home. We've referenced this before. Um, that's really bad for liquidity across the market, like broad liquidity. And, and I think that is something that's, you know, a, a something we're likely to see in 2023 is, is a different type of move coming and a second move phenomenon because where the vol has been well supplied, the that has been holding it all together as things fly around around the center, is now actually weakening. And I think that's an important thing to note in the short term uh, liquidity. I think this this next move will release risk premiums higher. Uh, and and they'll, I think they'll secularly stay higher after that, much like as a tornado comes through town, uh, you know, that, that hurts uh, risk premium sellers when it happens. Afterwards, there's a massive, uh, you know, opportunity in insurance generally. I think we're going to enter a period because of these other long-term trends I've talked about with Vol, where after this next move happens, there'll be a big opportunity to harvest risk premium and to broadly as a secular trend for the next five, 10 years, really uh, take advantage uh, of some of these trends. But in the short term, I think liquidity is the word of the next year. Um, and something uh, particularly at the center that hasn't broken yet, which I think uh, at the center, it, it is breaking. Um, and I think that's important to know. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly a topic we will stay uh, on top of as we move into 2023. Speaking of 2023, that is going to be my last topic. Um, you know, we're going to round off this conversation, um, two-part conversation with a glimpse into 2023. Uh, you all had different type of ways of phrasing it. Uh, Mark wrote, uh, what will be the big risks 
and opportunities for 2023. Um, also, uh, I can't remember who wrote this. Uh, what should allocators do in 2023 with their portfolios? Could have been you, Alan. Um, and also geopolitical uh, events, so to speak. Um, I'm going to kick it off selfishly uh, and just say a couple of things that that I would uh, worry about. I'm not so sure whether it's a 2023 event. It could be building up during that year. It could be something that we don't see until 2024. Um, but I can't help noticing some of the risks we've seen already uh, this year in the pension fund system. We saw it in the UK with the guilt. We've seen now uh, the largest uh, public pension plan in Denmark losing 47% of their reserve capital in the first nine months of this year. Um, I think this is um, much more um, critical um, because of the shifts we've talked about already um, with uh, secular inflation and 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 high interest rates uh, potentially. Um, and also the other thing I worry about could be if we do see um, inflation rise uh, again next year, if we do see interest rates go up, uh, and no pivot. Uh, I wonder if the market could um, basically lose confidence in uh, in the policies in the central banks. I think that can also be a, a massive um, uh, event uh, for the market. So, uh, is it twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four? I have no idea. But those are some of the bigger things that that I would worry about. Um, anyways, Alan, what are your thoughts uh, as you look into the new year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mentioned kind of shadow banking, which includes pension funds. Obviously, that, that's pension funds, hedge funds, insurance companies. All of those are um, part of that ecosystem. And so in terms of risks, I think that's one thing I would be focused on. Um, I think as well, uh, you know, uh, and kind of linked to that, that, that a lot of these have gone heavily into privates, you know, and how does that play out? So at some point, do we get... A remarking of assets, you know, it just it doesn't appear to have happened yet. You know, we heard about the Blackstone um, story, and part of the reason that they had the outflows was because REITs generally were down in value, and their fund hadn't marked down yet. So people took advantage of that. So I think how the the story, you know, obviously we don't know how public markets will will, will, will trade from here, but but at some point, if we did see this markdown in privates, how that impacts all of those kind of. Um, in, investors who've gone so heavily into um, in, into that sector. I think from an economic perspective, you know, and markets generally, the thing I'm looking at is the the lags of this, you know, as we said, we've had this jump from zero to 5%. Nothing's broken yet. That doesn't mean, you know, we're not going to see a non-linear reaction at some point. That could be next year. It could be that we see you know, you, you can we, the data ISM services came out strong. You know, you could have a couple of months of strong numbers, and it keeps the Fed going. But then you ultimately get a non-linear response to to the higher rates. So I think back to the financial crisis, and back then, you know, a lot of people had these adjustable rate mortgages in the U.S. So when rates started to go up, you didn't get much of a reaction to higher rates. But then you reached a kind of a tipping point where you got a um, you know, a uh, non-linear uh, r- response to higher rates. So I think that's a possible scenario if I had to make some kind of projection from from uh, the economic pers- perspective that, that that could be the scenario. But, but you know, who knows? As we say, all of these are just um, just stories that we tell that might play out. But but uh, but I definitely think that the private sector is going to be tested, um, you know, through this uh, uh, next downturn or through this part of the cycle. Sure, sure. Rob, what are your... Um I mean, that's been two negatives. Do you have a positive <laughs> outlook maybe for 20 <laughs> <laughs> You know me, I'm always positive. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I think I'm going to spin the, th- the theme a bit further, really, because I, I do think that the one thing that worries me is things that we don't know about. So if I think back to 07, like February 07, how many people knew about things like CDO squares and, and, and you know, and, and leveraged MBS and stuff? People just didn't know this stuff existed until it blew up in our faces. And, and this was exactly the same with the um, the LDI crisis in, in the UK a few months ago. Uh, it was just a completely unexpected thing that no one seemed to know was there. I mean, maybe only a few people knew about the, the, these things, and none of them predicted what was going to happen. So that, that stuff does worry me. Um, I think kind of going back to our early conversation about crypto, what's been staggering is the number of relatively respectable you know PE funds that invested in S- 
in um, in FTX, for example. Um, I think that out there, there's a lot of people sitting on um, le- leverage bets. In, you know, it's the classic when the tide comes out, you can see who's been swimming naked. You know, the tide is start, really starting to recede. And, and I think there are we're going to see a lot of leverage balance sheets kind of blowing up here, there and everywhere um, with people who've bought stuff in this desperate hunt for yield when interest rates were low. You know, they've, they've just gone out and sought returns where they could get them. They've leveraged them up to juice up the returns. Um, and, you know, I, that that's not a an unexpected thing because it happens all the time. But, uh, you know, as... As as you said, it's their private markets, right? They're they're um, they're things that aren't easily visible and observable, and it's not until the explosion happens that that we can, you know, that that we can see them happening. And these sort of so-called black swan events are, by definition, really really hard. Apart from, of course, investing in a tail protection fund, a reputable one, uh, <laughs> really hard to know how to kind of quote unquote insure yourself against them. So, uh, so yeah, it does it does worry me that that there's a, probably a lot of a lot of these bad stories going to come out in the next few few months or co- even couple of years yeah mark before we get to jim who will have the final word what uh what are your what are you looking for in the new year mark so what i love is the fact that there is dispersion and dispersion meaning that there's pl- plenty of differences in points of view let's take the optimistic point of view. If you look at Fed forecasts, a lot of forecasts from Wall Street economists, they're arguing that interest rates and inflation is going to come down in the second half of the year. So from an optimistic point of view, you could say this could be a great round trip environment. We made money as rates went up and inflation went higher. And then we're going to figure out how to make money when it reverses and go back the other way. So, so, so that's the great optimistic round trip story that will sustain trend following for 2023. On the negative side, what we'll sort of say is that I'll call it the uh, uh, the cockroach story. And usually, when you have, uh, if you find one cockroach, usually you can be rest assured there's more than one out there. So if we have one crisis, we're going to have a multiple crisis, and that's the likely that's going to be on the negative side, that we're going to have one blow up, and that's going to lead to others is, uh, that we're going to see. And part of that blow up risk, or the uh, there's the cockroach of behavior, and there's a cockroach of policy. I uh, My prediction is, is that whoever is in charge of government policy, whether fiscal or monetary, they will make mistakes. <laughs> We've already seen the mistakes. Will they ever admit that they've made policy mistakes? The answer is no. Uh, but we know that they'll occur. And from that, there will be have to be adjustments. And those adjustments create trends. And those create opportunities. Absolutely. All right, Jim, the pressure is on you. Final word, outlook for 2023 as we uh, wrap up this um, amazing conversation. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm going to try and tie it all together. I Rob mentioned, ex, you know, uh, you can't predict the unexpected. We're likely to get more unexpected. But as we referenced earlier in the conversation, you can predict the shape, right, and uh, and the distribution uh, broadly if you if you get these things right. And and I think it's important to note that um, you know we saw during other periods of inflation. Um, a clustering, right? You know, the, a clustering of, of things, a fatter tail, um, less liquidity, uh, more risk premium, as we mentioned, but, but less liquidity also means uh, things are changing fast uh, and there's less ability to absorb them. So you get more of unexpected. So expect the unexpected, right? Uh, that doesn't, that, that sounds like we're making no prediction. That's not true. We are talking about the shape of outcomes and, and how one should be generally positioned as a function of that. Um, Mark, mentioned, uh, you know, this cockroach theory, um, during periods of high inflation, you get uh, resource scarcity, because there's less liquidity, uh, power matters more centralization power, you you were were transitioning. You know, this is what happens during inflationary periods from a time of cooperation, where corporations are getting all the money, and corporations are global, and there's cooperation, right, to a time of, hey, there's scarcity of money, there's scarcity of uh, hence commodities of labor, and these things drive competition and more of unexpected kind of power shifts uh, that leads to war historically, that leads to uh, commodity uh, crises, that leads to funding crises. Resources are more important. So if you have the US, the reserve currency, that's a major source of power. You have leverage. If you have commodities, that's a source of power, it's a source of leverage. If you uh, have labor, 
you know, that's a source of leverage, as a source of power. These things are, are fundamental truths and, and, and important, and, and they have less importance in a time of cooperation where we're working across borders. But this is a time of nationalism, protectionism. We saw this during the 60s and 70s. We saw, you know, this is part of what drove the Vietnam War. This is part of what drove uh, the OPEC crisis. This is tri- part of what drove labor rights and protectionism. This is These are things that we're likely to see in the periods ahead. Again, it speaks to the shape. Uh, you know, we're likely to get dollar-denominated debt crises and things along those lines as well. More recessions, more tails, more often, um, you know, a, a more leptocurtic fat tail distribution. So I think, I think that's kind of uh, to kind of, if I, if I was to button it up and talk about, you know, what, what, what the trends are, those things will ultimately lead to more inflation, right? More labor rights, more protectionism, more competition ultimately means uh, less uh, free market economics, more, uh, uh, more, uh, you know, protectionism, like I said, uh, more, more labor rights, uh, more populism, I think is the word of the day. And those things ultimately, I mean, higher interest rates for a more secular time um, and more short-term crises. Wow. Can I just say, I think we've got a winner for today, which is using the word leptocurtic gives you 500 <laughs> points, which puts you at the top Leave of the lead. Leave it to the ball guy, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. On that note, we're going to wrap up this uh, part two of our conversation. We hope that you enjoyed last week's part one, as well as today's episode. And if you did, as usual, we would so much appreciate if you would head over to iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, leave a rating and review so that more people can find the podcast and make sure you follow the podcast um, so that you know every time we publish a new episode. Next week, we're going to be back with our usual format. Make sure you join us uh, and send your questions to info at toptradersonplug.com. We've got some great midweek episodes also coming up uh, that I'm already aware of. So uh, make sure you catch them as well. From Rob, Jim, Mark, Alan and me, thank you ever so much for all of your support in 2022. We love you. We appreciate you. And we look forward to being back with you next week. Until that time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.